I remember a number of years ago, I had been invited to preach at a church in uh, Denver. I was living in the Denver area at the time, and I was invited to preach at a church in Denver. And I loved being a guest preacher because I loved meeting people, and I enjoyed the opportunity to sort of do the meet and greet after the service. And I was standing at the door of the, the church building, as, as we do here when everyone's here, uh, greeting people, and I saw a man begin to move his way towards me, tall, slender, casually dressed, and he approached me, approached me, and I, of course, extended my hand. When we could do that, I extended my hand to say hello. And he stepped into what I will call my personal space. You know that space, right, when he's right in my face? And in a very sarcastic tone, he said, just what gives you the authority to preach to us? Don't you know your place? It, it was like someone slapped me in the face. Stunned and shocked, I stepped back from him. <laughs> my mind blank and my tongue twisted. And for what seemed like a long time, though I, I know it was only a second or two, I couldn't speak. And then, without human thought, I said, God, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Thank you for coming today and I walked away. When I hear this reading of the chief priests questioning Jesus' authority, I feel the sting, that sting in my heart that that man's words many years ago brought to me. Perhaps it's human nature to question authority, particularly if what is being done or said seems to be a threat. The chief priests and elders were encountering a man who seemed to promote change. Oh, my goodness. Yes, and I think he was threatening, threatening the way of life they had always known. Jesus was calling into question not just their beliefs, but their actions. It seemed that what they said and what they did weren't always the same thing. Perhaps they weren't walking their talk. I love Matthew's gospel. It's the Jewish gospel, and it's addressing the Jewish attitudes. And Matthew's strategy was that of sort of like the Trojan horse where he brings to the people that th those things that, you know, they can go, yeah, yeah, I, I got that. I agree with that. I agree with that. And then there's a surprise, that causes them to stop and think. And so he spoke in the language and the contexts which the Jews would accept, but filled his writing with truths that were, shall we say, unexpected and perhaps even devastating. There's a, a story I read once, speaking of things not turning out exactly the way you think they should. There's a story about a missionary who was scheduled to speak about his mission work at a church, and so he gets up really early, early, early Sunday morning and drives the distance that he has to go many miles, preached two services and spent the afternoon speaking with the members of the congregation. As he was leaving late that evening, the treasurer of the church gave him an envelope, and he tucked it inside his coat pocket. Well, when he got home, it was very late, and as he was taking off his coat, he remembered the envelope. He turned on the light in the bathroom, and he opened it, and out fell a check. His name was written, of course, across the check on the line, and below his name, on the line below his name, was written, a million thanks, the treasurer. <laughs> Surprise, no doubt. Not exactly what he expected, what he had thought he was going to get.
Sometimes words, just the words, aren't enough. To make this point, Jesus tells another story, a par- another parable. It's about a man who has two sons, and he sends one son to his vineyard, and the son refused to go, then later changed his mind and headed for the fields. And then the father sent his second son to go and work in the vineyard, and the son said, nope, I am not going to go, but then changed his mind, and he set foot in the fields. Which son did the will of the father, Jesus asked. Which of the two boys was, did the will of the father? Of course, Jesus' listeners realized what a slam dunk question this was, and they said, well, yeah, of course, it's the first son. And then, what does Jesus do? He pulls the rug out from under them by saying, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Things have just gone from a questioning stage to a story stage to a confrontation stage. And yes, this text was written for a particular context, but it remains relevant and perhaps just as shocking and surprising to us today. I wonder, now I'm only speaking for myself, but how often have we said yes and then not done anything? Anyone besides me out in the virtual land or here in the cathedral has said yes to a task and then either don't do it or do it in a shabby way? I've done that. I like to think that pattern of behavior was left behind in my childhood when I was repeatedly told to clean my room and it never happened or if it did, Everything was underneath the bed or in the closet. I'm pretty sure, I am pretty sure that when I was in junior high school, I had my own private growth of bacteria in my room. In Jesus' parable, we have to accept that both boys didn't quite do what they'd said they would do. For in each case, behavior was not consistent with what they had said. I believe what Jesus is trying to convey to the folks and maybe to us is that talk, talk, and walk, walk. Walk your talk. But even more than that, don't just talk. Don't just talk. Move beyond telling people what you believe. Show with actions. I love that song. I just think, I thought of something. Bruce, I love that song. What wonder to love is this. Jesus laid aside his crown. It wasn't just talk. It was action. The son's, first son's change of mind or change of heart is a metaphor for those in, who, in Jesus' time, perhaps were the outcasts, those who recognize their need of God through repentance and, surrender, and they surrender themselves into God's hands. The son who says, yes, I'll go, and then through the change of mind decides not to go is the indictment, perhaps, of the religious leaders. Long on words and short on action. I was watching an interview this week with Bishop Michael Curry. He's the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And many of you will remember Bishop Curry's amazing sermon at the royal wedding a couple of years ago and his moving and energizing reflection on the power of love. He's written a new book. It's entitled Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times. In this book and in his interview, he claims that love is what moves us, motivates us, challenges us, not just to talk about what we believe or what we think is important. It's love, God's love, love that has been abundantly bestowed on us from God. 
It's an experiential love with Jesus Christ that enkindles within us the desire and the determination to be mercy, not to talk about mercy, but to be mercy, to be forgiveness, to be kindness, to be grace, and to be love in the world in which we live. Love, God's love through us, is what makes it possible to hold on to hope in these troubling times. I must say that during this season of political decision-making, I implore all of us to listen and to search beyond the rhetoric that you hear and to seek out the actions of our politicians. As Christians who choose to serve God through the Episcopal tradition, we have a standard by which we are to live. I invite you to use the promises Look at those promises in our baptismal covenant as the norm by which you make your judgments and your decisions. I know that when I sit down with my ballot and I prepare to vote, I will be asking myself these questions. How is this person someone who's striving for justice and peace for all people? How does this person, so far as I can tell, respect the dignity of every human being? How is this person seeking to serve all, all people? As Episcopalians, we're a wordy bunch. We have a lot of words, a lot of talking. We pray from our book of common prayer with lots of words. And the good news of Jesus Christ calls us beyond our words and into action. You know, the the saying that that has been reported came from from St. Francis, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. We all, each And every one of us have a way in which we can be the gospel through the lives we live, through the actions we take, through the deeds done. No deed, no action is too small or insignificant. A few years, last summer, we were in Plains, Georgia, went to see Maranatha Baptist Church where Jimmy Carter up until recently, President Jimmy Carter would teach um, Sunday school. There was a story told about a young man who'd made the trip to Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains and on one Sunday and he stood in a long line of visitors to listen to President Carter teach his Sunday school class. The man decided, well, that was pretty interesting. I think I'll stay for worship. So he found his way into the sanctuary, into the pew, and began to read the announcements that were on the back of the bulletin. Towards the middle, there was an announcement that read this. Rosalind Carter will clean the church next Saturday. Jimmy Carter will cut the grass and trim the shrubbery. Deeds. What are we doing for the sake of the love of Jesus Christ? May our yes, may our yes to God's call be accomplished in our actions. For God's love will always, always, always find a way.